In this module of our video series on federalism, the question we hope to answer is, how do federal countries organize the raising, spending, and sharing of money? There will be three sections to this module which will help us examine the question. Section one deals with how revenue is raised in a federal country. Section two deals with how revenue is spent and with the sharing of revenues to bring revenue and spending into balance. And section three deals with how the sharing of revenue through a mechanism called equalization works. A great deal of what all governments do involves money. Policies relating to social welfare, transportation, health, the military, and education all involve spending money. Governments must find a way to pay teachers and soldiers and to finance the building of roads, bridges, hospitals, airports, and schools. In order to do all that, they must raise money mostly through taxes. One of the key decisions federal countries must make is how to share money-raising powers among the different governments. Federal countries have chosen to do this in different ways. In some, such as Canada and Switzerland, the constituent units collect over half the revenues and the federal government collects less than half. We call these fiscally decentralized federations. In other federal countries, the federal government collects between 60 and 75 percent of the revenues, while the states, provinces, or other units collect the rest. This group includes Australia, Germany, India, Spain, Belgium, and Brazil. Then there are those federal countries where the central government collects over 80 percent of the revenue, such as Argentina, Malaysia, Mexico, Russia, and South Africa. And there are a small number of federal countries in which the federal government collects more than 95% of all revenue. Venezuela and Nigeria are among these. These are fiscally centralized federations. One phenomenon that occurs when constituent units do collect much of the revenue is something that's called tax competition. Though such competition has its advantages, it also has serious drawbacks. Well, there can be good and bad comp uh, competition in federations uh, uh, on these kinds of things. Um, that, you know, the bad consequences could be that you destroy a tax base. So, for example, inheritance tax. In a number of federations where, where you've had de decentralized inheritance tax, uh, there's, there's been what's called a rush to the bottom and each, each constituent unit has cut its inheritance tax to try to attract people to come to die there in their constituency, in their province or state. And in the end, they've ended up with zero-based uh, inheritance tax. Um, you can also find that you, people end up making locational decisions based on what the tax rates are. And uh, economists object to this because it can undermine the efficiency of the economy. If, if companies are moving their headquarters to a particular uh, part of the country because of the tax rate, not because of the fundamental economics of being in that part of the country, that might not make a lot of sense in terms of good economic management. Taxes on sales of goods and services and on income are a main source of government revenue. Another important source for some federations is revenue from natural resources such as oil and gas, diamonds and other minerals. Nigeria is a major oil and gas producer and those resources provide most of that country's revenues. The federal government collects those revenues and shares them with the states. It decides how much to share on the basis of state populations, which states actually provide the gas and oil, and the need to achieve some equality among the states. Russia is similar to Nigeria. It's also a major producer of oil and gas, and the federal government collects most of the revenue from those resources 
through special resource taxes called royalties and through export taxes. Argentina and Canada have a very different way of dealing with natural resources. In these countries, the provinces collect most of the natural resource revenues. This means that some provinces, such as Alberta in Canada, are much richer than the others. The United States is similar, although in both Canada and the United States, the federal government controls resource revenues on its own lands. In most federal countries, the federal government controls offshore resource revenues. Canada is exceptional in that the coastal provinces get the benefit of resources found off their own shores. When federal countries decide how to allocate revenue, they have to take a number of matters into account. One issue is accountability. Governments that spend money should be responsible for raising at least some of that money. Another issue is equity. In many federations, there are poorer and richer constituent units. Federal countries have to decide whether poorer units should have to tax their citizens more, provide a lower level of services, or should receive financial help. We will talk more about that issue later on. A third issue is sound administration. What is the most efficient and effective way to manage revenue collection? Some say it is best when it is centrally controlled, even if the revenue actually belongs to the constituent units. These are matters federations must consider. No two are exactly alike in practice. After federal countries decide who collects revenues and how, they have to decide who spends it and how. As with revenue raising, there is great variation among federations in how they share spending. In Switzerland, Belgium and Canada, the federal government only does 30 to 40 percent of total spending. The constituent unit governments of these three countries have considerable constitutional responsibilities in fields such as health and education, where they need to spend a lot of money. While the German federal government collects between 60 and 70 percent of revenues, it gives a good part of that money to the constituent units for them to spend because they are responsible for delivering many federally legislated programs. In many other federal countries, federal spending accounts for from 45 to 60 percent of the total. These include Mexico, Argentina, Australia, Austria, the United States, India, Nigeria, Spain, South Africa, and Russia. Malaysia and Venezuela are very centralized and the federal government spends about 80 percent of the total in those countries. All central governments collect more revenue than they need for their own exclusive federal responsibilities such as the army. They all transfer some of that extra money to the provinces, states or other units of the federation, but they do it in very different ways. In Canada, Switzerland, and the United States, the provinces, cantons, and states raise most of the money they spend. Transfers from the federal government can be as little as 10% of their total spending. At the other extreme, the provinces of South Africa and the states of Nigeria and Mexico depend on transfers from their federal governments for almost 90% of their spending. The autonomous communities of Spain and the communities and regions of Belgium also receive much of the money they spend from their federal governments. In these newly federal countries, the constituent units have many costly responsibilities, but not a matching capacity to raise money to pay for them. Germany, Australia and India are somewhere in between. The federal governments of those countries provide a bit less than half the money spent by the lender, territories, and states. Federal countries normally allocate spending on the basis of constitutionally assigned responsibilities. The federal government almost always gets to spend on the foreign service, the currency, and the armed forces. 
the constituent unit governments very often get to spend on schools and hospitals. In a number of federal countries, however, such as Australia, India, and Malaysia, the federal government has the constitutional power to spend in areas that the Constitution assigns to the provinces, states, or other constituent units. These federal governments, and also the federal government of the United States, have almost unlimited power to spend in areas of constituent unit responsibility. Germany, as we learned earlier, has an interlocking model of federalism, which means that many federal laws and programs are implemented by the constituent units. In Canada, the federal government's rights to spend in provincial areas such as health and education are limited by intergovernmental agreement rather than court interpretation. In order for the federal government to spend in provincial jurisdictions, the majority of provinces must agree. Individual provinces have the right to opt out of such federal spending programs and receive financial compensation from the federal government. In most federal countries, there is a significant measure of inequality among the constituent units. Some are rich, some poor, some in between. This creates problems because while the constituent units have the same or almost the same responsibilities, they can have very different capacities to raise the needed money to discharge those responsibilities. One way that many federations deal with this challenge is through something called equalization. These are revenue sharing arrangements aimed at eliminating or reducing the unequal capacity of the constituent units. There are a number of different ways of doing equalization. Some equalization programs only reduce the unequal ability to raise revenues. Others try to address the financial needs of the constituent units. Some bring all units to the same level. Others only bring them to within a broad range. And some equalize only the poor units up to a certain level. In some federations, the the idea is to focus on the revenue raising capacity and to have a national standard where you bring all the constituent units up to some sort of national standard in terms of their capacity to raise revenues. That might not mean that they're all having exactly the same revenue raising capacity because some could be above that standard, but you're raising them at least to a certain level. Uh, but there's also the expenditure side where, where you can look at uh, the needs that different constituent units have. So if you look at some federations, uh, they sometimes consider things like mountainous terrain, the size of the, size of the, uh, the territory that has to be managed, uh, the need for basic services so that a small, very small constituent unit has certain costs associated just with being, being a constituent unit, uh, and so they get some consideration for that. So you get different formulae for different countries. Not every country has an, an equalization program as such, but they all have various formulae for allocating revenues from the federal to the constituent units, from the federal government to the constituent units, and these can be more or less equalized. All equalization programs take the form of unconditional transfers. The federal government gives the money to the constituent units without telling them how they should spend it. There are also conditional transfers for particular programs such as help for the poor, for schools or for hospitals. The constituent units then must spend those transfers only on the specified programs and often on the basis of federal government rules. In Canada, for instance, the Canada Health Act lays out rules for provincial spending of federal health transfers, and there are financial penalties for not respecting those rules. While most federations have both unconditional equalization grants and conditional transfers, the United States only has the conditional kind it does not attempt overall equalization. The United States 
uh, does have very significant number of transfers to the, from the federal government to the states, uh, but it's a whole series of individual programs, and this reflects the way the United States functions at the center. I mean, Congress, it's, it's been described, Congress has been described as a system of sort of bumper cars uh, with all these lobbyists and political parties and senators and members of the legislature sort of competing to get different programs. Uh, when they do get programs, they tend to be fairly detailed, but there are over 200 transfer programs to the states from Washington, and each of these programs has different criteria for allocation uh, to the states, and there's no kind of overall architecture, and there's no equalization program as such. That is our brief look at the big topic of money and the economy and federalism. It should be of interest to everyone because it is at the heart of how federal countries provide services to their citizens. Our question for this module is, how do federal countries organize the raising, spending and sharing of money? To reinforce our learning and to address our module question, I would like you to answer the following questions. Some are true and false questions, and some are multiple choice questions. Let us start with a few true and false questions. One, one of the key decisions federal countries must make is how to share money-raising powers among the central and constituent unit governments. Is this statement true or false? The answer is, it is true. Two, in fiscally decentralized federations, constituent unit governments collect all the revenue. Is this statement true or false? The answer is, it is false. Normally, the constituent unit governments collect between 20 and 55% of the revenue, and the federal or central government collects the rest. Three, in fiscally centralized federations, the central government collects the majority or nearly all the revenue. Is this statement true or false? The answer is true. Four, taxes and revenue from natural resources are two sources of government revenues. Is this statement true or false? The answer is it's true. Five, which of the following issues should be taken into account by federal countries when deciding how to share revenue? A. Accountability. This means that the government that spends money should be responsible for raising some of the money. B. Equity. This means that there should be a fair distribution of revenue between poorer and richer constituent units. C. Sound administration. This means there should be effective and efficient ways to manage revenue. D. All of the above. E. None of the above. Well, the answer is all of the above. That brings us to the end of our examination of fiscal federalism, money and how federalism works. <laughs>